Right. Awesome. Awesome. Welcome. Welcome, team. And welcome to Making Connections for Prevention, a probation peer learning opportunity. Um, this came about because probably about two years ago in me doing, the, oh, let me back up. My name is Troy Nichols, <laughs> and I am uh, the one of one of the senior technical assistant specialists for strategies. Hopefully, most of you know who we are. I'm sure since you're here, um, but with that, the history of this, we began this process probably about two years ago when I realized in working with about five county prevention teams that there was a unique need for prob for probation. And what I mean by unique is there were um, some times that we had to define things in a different way. There were times that we had to um, talk about fit, where where probation, juvenile probation fits in this whole CPP process. Um, so what I did with my particular counties and a few other counties were involved is we got together just to talk about it. I didn't know what was gonna happen, to be honest. I had some good background information from OCAP at the time. A lot more has come out since then. Um, and, and what we did was we began a discussion about various topics within the comprehensive prevention planning window, and it served us pretty well. Um, we decided that we wanted to do it again, and for various reasons, um, it did not happen until now. And what we realized is in that process, working with Rob Doty and Kathy Martinez, um, we realized that, you know, this may be something from today that we want to implement in some other place, maybe a meeting that already happens with the um, uh, chief probation officers of California. Maybe we want to come together as our own group, because um, although our, some of our needs are very similar to the larger groups, we have some different pathways, we have some different avenues that we sometimes, and when I say we, I'm talking juvenile probation, obviously, that we have to travel and we want to talk about that. So this is much more of a facilitated conversation. Um, we're going to present some information, but then our hope is uh, to collect questions, to collect best practice. What are you doing that's been working and where are we confused and what do we need to uh, untie as some of those knots? So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Chief Probation Officers of California's consultant, Kathy Martinez. Kathy, take it away. Thank you, Troy. No formal introduction, I think, <laughs> is needed. Um, but yes, and just to kind of add to that, as, as a member of the planning team, we thought that we wanted to have something specific for probation that would be sort of helping you all along, in the, whether you're still in the planning process or if you already completed your plan and thinking about implementation, because we know different counties are in different places with your, their CPPs. So uh, we really wanted to create a space um, specifically for probation. So thank you everyone for joining us and welcome. And I'm glad to see everybody uh, participating in the two day convening. So we wanted to start off because I think as Troy mentioned, there are some questions that came up previously through his um, small uh, group. And so we thought we'd kind of start there. And so one of the questions that came up was, you know, where, where is, what is the role of probation when, it, when we talk about the community pathway? And, you know, when we think about the community pathway, I'm gonna own that I, I sort of borrowed uh, this graphic from, it was an assessment center uh, webinar that I was in. And they kind of talked about prevention as, as more of an off ramps and different stages of prevention. And, and so I kind of tweaked it a little bit to kind of cater towards uh, the community pathway and the FFPS programs as it pertains to prevention. And so you see the different four different um, off ramps here that kind of speak to the various tiers of prevention that are written into the plan. So we have our Title IV-E candidates. So you see the juvenile justice systems at the very right-hand side, and then you have uh, the community, really the commu probably a community on the left side. As, as youth kind of trickle up towards our system, um, there's various off ramps and, and things that we can kind of do to address those youth and families' needs 
earlier in the process before they formally get involved into our system. And so when we talk about or think about the community pathway in that primary tier, we kind of see that as that primary tier, that primary early, early intervention piece where they may not have yet been referred to us. Maybe they have an, an older sibling who is involved in the juvenile justice system, um, or maybe you know they, they're just exhibiting some at-risk uh, behaviors through some other systems, maybe through education, through schools, through maybe um, a physician has um, seen some risk factors coming in. Um, so it's just that early, early tier, um, early prevention. And then you have those secondary and tertiary tiers um, further along. And so you have the different off ramps where the secondary, they could be candidates, they could meet the at risk population, or they could not be so um, they can kind of fall into that primary tier see in those two off ramps those middle off ramps they could be a combination of those populations whether they're candidates or maybe they're they didn't quite meet that threshold of being a candidates but you still kind of see there's some some risk factors in there that kind of place those kids at risk um, and then further along um, as they approach the juvenile justice system. Then, you know, once they come in, then we assess them as 4E candidates. Um, and then further along into the system you have, once they get into the system, then we're looking at the true candidacy kids of those who are at risk of being removed from their home. So these are, this just sort of depicts kind of um, just the pathway, if you will, to of that prevention piece of early intervention, um, that primary tier all the way to the tertiary tier. So when we also, when we think about, if we look at the blue box, that's, that secondary tertiary tier, those could be some of the young people who may have uh, committed felonies, misdemeanors, who may fall into the category of the deferred entry of judgment. They may be exhibiting some of those, some of those risk factors and being a felony diversion program, that might be a category that you could probably may be able to serve some of those youth as well. So I'll pause there um, with this visual. Um, just kind of want to throw that out there. I don't know how many counties are where they are along in terms of their target population, where you all are at. Um, if you are in the secondary, if you're looking at the primary, if you're really kind of looking at youth who have been referred to us further over here in this green box area who assessing young people for uh, candidacy. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause there. If anybody wants to feel free to unmute, um, feel free to do so and, and kind of share your experience in your population. Does anybody have anything they wanna share? And if anyone at any point does have a question or something they'd like to share, but they'd rather not go off of mute, you can type it in the chat and I will read it out. Perfect. Thank you, Brent. Hey, Kathy. Yeah. Could I just ask the group real quick? Do you guys see yourselves fitting into this? Like, where do you guys yeah. see yourselves fitting into this model? Because I know when I first embarked on this, the primary prevention concept was one that um, uh, I feel like juvenile probation wasn't as entrenched in as they were the tertiary and the secondary. So where do you guys see you fit? Anybody? I'll go. Um, I could tell you that from Ventura County, we've been involved with the primary from, I mean, for many years. And actually because of that, we have reduced our numbers of youth on probation you know, coming into the system because we do a lot of diversion work, do a lot of preventative work. We, we have shifted to do more preventative programs. Um, we do more education with our judges to let them know, like, you know, for placement youth, you know, so rather than have them, you know, removed from the home and all that, what we can do. So for, for all three, we're obviously involved with all three levels, you know, three um, tiers, but I think we've really shifted to the primary now and that's more of a focus for us. So I'm really, I'm really proud of that. Thank you, Sandy, definitely. And and to know that is is encouraging. So we may lean on you to get some best practice because that's that's definitely a good testimony for um developing that primary prevention aspect. Thank you. 
Anybody else? So I'll go from uh, Sacramento. Um, so we kind of looked at it very similarly, but we looked at it within the justice system because for us, we were looking at it once kids, we didn't really deal with them till they hit our doors or, you know, citations at those levels. So we kind of looked at it as our prevention level would be before the courts either adjudicated or even put on informal. And then we would, um, very similar to this, you had different points of prevention within the different levels. So you have pre-court, you have post-court prevention at the informal level and community level. And then you have also all the way up to like our placement division and, you know, youth that are put out of home placement all the way up. But um, we would probably, we're focusing a lot more on the, the, um, obviously the prevention and early intervention stuff. So we're doing it um, probably would be in the, like in the community, but working with providers before kids are even adjudicated through court or before their courts are, before their, um, get them into services at their first point of contact basically. Yeah. And then kind of see how that goes. Definitely. Thank you, Robert. And and hopefully the remainder of you um, are seeing some pieces. This was an eye opener for me when Kathy first brought it together to kind of begin to guide our path and, and, and uh, have a better understanding of the prevention work. Uh, back to you, Kathy. Great. Thank you. Does anybody have any anything else? I know I'm um, trying to think there may have been a county on this primary tier looking at SARB referrals. And mm -hmm. SARB referrals mm -hmm. is a good early primary prevention population to consider as well. So um, thank you all for sharing that. Shannon uh, shared in the uh, chat that um, Riverside County was previously involved in primary, but has shifted into focusing on secondary and tertiary. Um, and we have a hand raised from Megan. Hi, Good morning, um, Kathy. That might have been Humboldt County. We are making SARB referrals to our parent project class, and we have a probation officer that's teaching parent project in conjunction with one of the local school resource officers and another diversion program. So through our probation diversion program, we attend SARB boards and make referrals to parent project that we're teaching, and that's how we're addressing the um the first, the primary tier, and we're addressing barriers for families by providing meals and child care with one of the local schools. So it's been a great partnership. That's great. That's great. Thank you. There was one comment in chat. Um, it came from... Jimmy in Santa Cruz. Yes. Um, we recognize that although we are not first responders, that we do partner with schools and families to divert youth to community partner agencies with hopes that we do not need to escalate intervention to the court's attention. Awesome. Thank you, Jimmy. That's Definitely. Great. Yeah. Thank you all. Okay. Oh, so another think... hands up. Oh, okay. Katie? Oh, there we Sorry, go. I was just going to add at uh, Mendocino County, uh, we partner with our schools and our CBOs to where the schools can make the referrals directly to our CBO that we, we fund. And so what they're identifying some uh, youth that are in need of uh, intervention and prevention services, and the schools can make the direct referral, and then we pay for that those funding of those services. Nice. Thank you, Katie. Definitely. And this is all about basic relationship building, right? Finding the right people to talk to, finding the right connections so that we know what the process is and how we smooth it out, definitely. Okay, anything else? See another comment. Uh, looks like Merced County, we, oops, went away. We are. We are participant on SAR boards. We have community officers that are participating in community events. We are in the process of opening up a community center to provide early intervention. That's great. And then Ventura County partnered with public health to work with families who have been referred to SAR. This has helped to get to the root cause and then referrals are made for services needed by the family. 
That's great. So both of those examples, really looking at those early risk factors, looking at those needs early, early on to try and um, keeping kids from entry at least the juvenile justice system. But we also know that the earlier the intervention, it can also help prevent other system entries as well by addressing those needs earlier um, in that use life. Cool. Any other comments or questions or anything else that people want to share? Okay. We can go ahead and bump on over to the next area. So as part of the uh, five-year plan, as you all know, the five-year plan was uh, another iteration was submitted. It was approved back in November. And within that, within that plan, there are some expanded, sort of expanded candidacy populations that were included. And so by expanded, it doesn't necessarily mean that these as standalone factors would automatically make a youth um, identified as at risk and as a, a candidate, but really more of the collective risk factors that contribute to that youth that can kind of help that collectively would place a youth higher at risk. So it could be a combination of these um, expanded identified populations in conjunction with some of the other risk factors that you all have identified through your own risk assessments. So really kind of looking at the full picture and do these things collectively kind of place the youth um, at additional risk and could fall into that expanded candidacy population. It looks like there's a comment. Oh, thank you, Brent. It's a five-year plan there. So with looking at these, um, it's the expanded populations as they are listed here and in the plan, um, where do you all have any thoughts in terms of how you all are identifying um, the youth and how they would fall into some of this expanded candidacy definition? Um, have you all considered looking at this? And if so, how how is that working? Where are you all at with that? How is it working for you? Um, yeah. Seth? Yeah, you can go ahead. Well, sure. You know, I was going to say, I think we're all, at least in San Francisco, um, San Francisco County, we're, we're certainly looking at this, but at the same time, kind of waiting to see sort of what some more, the more specific, you know, um, requirements are going to be to actually implement this extent, extended or expanded definition. It's not entirely clear to me just from this how, you know, how the assessments are going to mesh with some of those other factors what kind of documentation. So I, we haven't really gone down the road of really thinking more about it other than what's about what's on that slide, which is very helpful, but at the same time, doesn't help really to kind of make things very concrete about, okay, this is what, you know, a case plan is going to have to look like, or this is how we're going to actually implement and operationalize some of this stuff until we hear more about how that's exactly going to work, which, you know, will be coming at some point, I assume. <clears throat> Thanks, Seth. Yes, um, I think. I'd be mean, curious to see if other people have that same experience, or if if, there, if people are doing more with this information than than we are here, because that would be great to understand how and, and sort of what is happening in some of the other counties regarding sort of operationalizing what this looks like. Yeah, if anybody has already made some adjustments to their candidacy to the evaluation. Um, to include we have reasons. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to put it, Kathy. Exactly, because we have not done any of that in the absence of anything more specific from CDSS or anybody else about what that's going to look like, because it just seems risky to us. <laughs> but yeah. maybe we're being risk we're too risk averse, and, and and I'd love to hear what other counties were doing. So, have any other counties already started or begun that process of looking at? The evaluation and how to address some of this and include some of these expanded populations here. 
So I know we in Sacramento have been working with JVI. That question came up very early when we saw some of the changes. And, you know, we wanted to make sure, too, we've been following what CPOC had put out. And mm -hmm. so we wanted to make sure that we're following kind of the guidelines. Um, JVI has kind of advised us that it still fits in in terms of candidacy and actually allows us maybe just a little bit more of a, um, uh, I don't have the info right off the top of my head, but I could post it or get it to Kathy to get to the group um, if there's some stuff. But I know there's been discussions. Um, I believe CPOC's been having some of those discussions as well about candidacy and what it is, but I think it just adds a little bit to it. Um, you know, certain things that we were, we weren't able to do before we're able to expand into that population. But um, I can tell you with us, it we're not really going like hog wild with like, oh, now we can do a ton, a ton of stuff. So I don't know if that helps, but I know if you're a county working with JBI, they have been knee deep in this for a bit, trying to determine it. Yeah, we don't work with JBI, but. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Uh, Victoria, do so you have your hand up? Hi, Kathy. I know you're a little Hi. bit familiar with our process. We currently use the evaluation imminent risk and reasonable candidacy form. Are you suggesting that's something that we could modify to add these factors to have a, a wider net for candidates? Yeah, yeah that's what we're, I was just asking if anybody sort of um, considered that and looking at this expanded population and thought about can we modify or how can we look at that initial that um, I guess they call it the referred to the error to the evaluation of imminent risk tool and to include some of these if anybody's even thought about and starting that process because I know um, as Robert in indicated CPOC is looking into that and we're also again like Seth was saying we're looking for some additional guidance from CDSS but I just wasn't sure if any of the other and if any of you all have sort of begun to kind of look at that and to see how can you maybe use this expanded candidacy population to sort of not necessarily widen it but ex just do that expand that population to fit your your part your prevention population but it sounds like we're all kind of hanging tight is what it sounds like to kind of wait for some additional direction either from us at CPOC and or from DSS. Well, and I, I just posted in the chat, I, but we, we don't have to talk about it more, but like what, what have been like in Sacramento, the benefits or the outcomes of any of using that expanded population as slight as it may be, like, is there, are more kids getting services or is there, there's not funding yet for it because, or at least not the federal funding part anyway, but I know some states. So I'm just wondering what the, concrete benefits are of sort of going further than just knowing that it's here and like we'll 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 eventually you know implement something more specific but yeah i think it's in in terms of your prevention it could distinguish your prevention candidacy group from your other traditional candidacy group who are at risk of removal from out of home placement in the way that we've always done candidacy. So this kind of gives a little bit more, hey, we, you know, we have these youth and these families with these other risk factors that could possibly place them at earlier on in the, in the juvenile justice process or whether they're in the primary or in the secondary, I mean, not the primary, but the secondary tertiary tiers. Um, to be able to provide some of those prevention services that may fall under that FFPSA piece. I think it also determines on or depends on your plan, what you're at what point you're going to put it at. If you're going to put your services in those secondary and tertiary realms versus if you put it just strictly at probation and where where you're at with that. Um, I, to answer your question, Seth, in terms of like results that we're seeing, we haven't Honestly, we haven't gotten to that point yet. I know. I know the results about... in the, 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 you know, the, the, not the big results, but like what's the practical change or that is happening, you know, right now? I mean, yes, I understand the benefit of like recognizing those kids who are in different tiers of prevention. Mm -hmm. And then what? <laughs> okay. So we know that now. That's great. But um, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't, 
Yeah, I'm just wondering sort of, and what happens after that, once we know that? <clears throat> yeah, and I think that the reason that these different populations, this expanded candidacy population list was created was because some of the kids in some of these areas are at higher risk of either, like I know LGBTQ are at much higher risk of suicidality. Um, homeless youth who experience physical abuse, again, those are places at higher risk of being trafficked um, and entering the juvenile justice system. Domestic violence also. I mean, these are, I guess, because these are other areas or other risk factors that place kids at a higher risk of becoming system involved. And so by looking at it collectively, in addition with the risk factors that we are already identifying and, and expanding it, the hope is to identify some of these youth earlier on to hopefully prevent either further penetration in the juvenile justice system or prevent any kind of referrals into the juvenile justice system or other systems. I don't know if that makes sense at all. You know, that makes perfect sense. No, that's that's the I mean, that's what we're doing. <laughs> I'm just trying to get a little more like understanding of what the but I get it. Yes. No, yeah. that's 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 yeah, why we're doing all this work. Like, <laughs> yeah. What can it look like? How do we really get down and, and identify and kind of, you know, at what point does it mean two risk factors? Does it mean three? Like yeah. how do you kind of differentiate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, exactly. And I'm, we're a little resistant or a little hesitant to like implement a whole bunch of changes to things without really understanding sort of what the, what the, what the ultimate requirements are going to be. That's all. So that's okay. Thanks for, for the feedback though. Yeah. Any other comments around this area here or questions or anything? I know this is one area that I have my radar on. Um, and I, I know that I'm kind of, I'll probably start asking more questions around your specific question, Seth, and you know, what does it mean? Does it mean two risk factors, three mix? What does that collective definition kind of mean for, for us? And so I can try and work on, on getting that, hopefully from CDSS, a little bit more guidance. Anything else? Okay, how are we doing on time? I think we're okay. We have about 38 minutes left. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, Troy. Definitely. So we, we included this slide because, well, first, before I even say that, Seth, thank you so much for putting those things out there. I mean, a lot of our work has been hurry up and wait, right? Hurry up, get it done now, wait some more. So. That's one of the reasons we're bringing this group together is just those sorts of questions, concerns, how are others trained, how are others moving through this, and hopefully we can continue this sort of dialogue within some other arena. So I really appreciate it. We put this slide in here because trauma-informed care, hopefully most of us are, are pretty uh, familiar with it. If not, you know, we have some links that we can drop in there. Um, but basically, trauma-informed care is, is, is something that has been adopted within this uh, comprehensive prevention planning work, um, understanding it, having it be implemented, really important. Um, some of the concepts around safety and, and trustworthiness and transparency, I think the most important in this to me right now is that collaboration and mutuality piece, uh, recognizing that healing kind of happens within relationships. And that's what we're talking about here, right? Developing relationships, um, I loved hearing about, you know, uh, probation officers going out into the community, right, going to community events, basing, you know, uh, your your success on your relationships. Um, really important aspect to this. One thing that uh, when I was training on this and providing social workers training that I always brought to the attention is this is not just for the families, right? This is not just for us to work with the kids and be trauma informed. We gotta be trauma informed within our own building. We have to have trauma informed supervision. We have to have trauma informed decision-making. Um, our waiting room should be trauma informed, you know, various things like that. How, what are we doing to make sure this permeates throughout uh, our process and understanding it and implementing it? Um, having our workers understand, you know, how to manage up, right? Supervision isn't one way. So a trauma-informed approach to when you have to make requests of your supervisor and doing various things like that. So just paying attention because 
all of these things are what we wish for our families, but we also have to wish them for our agencies, you know, safe environments where we not only are physically, but we're psychologically safe, that we're transparent. You know, if we can do it, we're going to do our best. If we can't, we're going to come back and tell you we could. Various things, peer support, making sure our families realize that not only depending on a system, but a peer support group is important. Um, I mentioned about collaboration, empowerment, huge aspect to what we need to be doing with our families, as well as paying attention to some of that history and that historical trauma, historical issues and challenges. When we talked about that population group, we're talking a lot about culture, right? Various cultures, various um, aspects of our work. So we just put this in here as a real reminder of uh, being trauma-informed, not only with our families, but within our buildings. If I, I can just kind of add to that, um, if you kind of look at them collectively, they do look a little familiar in terms of some of those guiding principles for integrated core practice model, some of the guiding principles for um, wraparound services. So it's, you know, looking at the trauma-informed care, it's, it doesn't seem like it's anything too new and different, um, but it is pretty important in terms of, you know, as we heard from our tribal partners earlier today, just that cultural and that historical um, trauma that comes into play that we don't always recognize, we don't always see right away. Any, is there is there anybody that has um, uh, an example of using this, or is this something you guys implement? No. Okay. All right. We could move on. All right. So moving on. So I know there's been a lot of uh, discussion around motivational interviewing and um, these are just a few resources that we uh, were able to identify. And I know there's a lot of questions around how you document MI, um, trying to figure out where it fits in your prevention continuum. Uh, concerns for fidelity, how you uh, keep your, your staff trained, are there boosters? Um, so we just kind of wanted to throw that out there and kind of have kind of hear from you all in terms of if you all have sort of gotten there in your process yet in terms of for you, those of you who are using MI, um, how you're training or how you think about um, implementing motivational interviewing uh, to fidelity and what that quality assurance uh, process or those techniques might look like. Now, I don't know if anybody's thought or gotten that far along in terms of trying to tackle that, because I know it's, I know a lot of departments have been doing motivational interviewing for a while, but um, just kind of wanted to throw that out there because we get some questions around that. At the in Humboldt County, we've used MI for a long time. We did have a lot of fidelity, but then we started incorporating it into EPICS and some of the other EBPs that we do, MRT. Um, and so we track it through those. But I know motivational interviewing is what the family resource centers and community resource centers are planning to use for their primary prevention activities. And the CQI has been one of my questions for them because it's a little more difficult when we were tracking that when we were originally trained. Yeah. Has anybody thought about or kind of working on that CQI piece for MI? I mean, that's what I was going to say in San Francisco County, that's where we're going to, I mean, motivational interviewing is in our plan and, you know, our human service agency is so, you know, very concerned about and, is thinking through all those questions about the CQI, et cetera, and um, probably has the same questions as uh, whoever the previous speaker was, you know, about sort of how that's exactly going to work. But um, that's an, another one of those sort of pending things that we're kind of <laughs> waiting to see sort of how it's all going to play out. But that's the, 
So I don't think we, we haven't gotten that far, Kathy, to answer your question in San Francisco yet about sort of what that's going to look like, except to say, that's concerning about what that's going to look like <laughs> and how we're going to do that and how it's going to get funded and blah, blah, blah. So, um, um, I think about Orange County. In Orange County, um, our child welfare partners, they are all in on motivational interviewing and they're using an AI company for the training and fidelity. It's called Listen, L-Y-S-S-N. And they're doing a sole contract for that um, that just got approved. So they're getting ready to set up their training. And I think they're talking about training 500 people right out of the gate. Um, for probation, we have we were thinking about motivational interviewing and we're not anymore. However, look, similar to Humboldt, um, our family resource centers um, will also be using motivational interviewing as well as our um, wraparound teams. Um, but that's as far as we've gotten. We really haven't even, we're just really still in the beginning stages of planning. Even though we have a draft uh, prevention plan, the probation part of it is very high level. The probation piece in, within the plan? Yes, the probation piece within our prevention plan is very high level. We're just not as far as our um, child welfare counterpart. By high level, you mean pretty broad and still kind of vague? You're still kind of working through all that? Yes, vague, broad, yes. <laughs> Up in the air, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ivy. I yeah. don't know if any other counties I, I know there's a, probably a few other counties that are in the same similar situation still trying to figure things out anybody else so it looks like there are a couple comments in the chat it looks like from Seth I should have pointed out that San Francisco uses our state allocations um, YOBG JPAF etc to fund many programs on the prevention off-ramp so we're doing the work of prevention how FFPSA will be incorporated into the operational aspects of those programs is what is pending thanks Seth yeah trying to get things to to fit together is always that fun part. And then it's like Jimmy from Santa Cruz says, we've been training our team about the practice of using a trauma-informed lens for a handful of years. However, that specific chart was not familiar. We have also been working with our court and court partners. There is room to grow, but we have been successful at developing a practice of being more trauma-informed in the last few years than prior. Use the CFTs, bringing families to the table, wraparound services have all helped. Great, thanks Jimmy for sharing. And then Sandy, we use MI in Ventura County, but need to work on the CQI part. So it sounds like a lot of you who are considering MI, that that's still the big looming question is uh, the CQI or the, the quality assurance and making sure the tracking and, and making sure it's done to fidelity. Definitely. Uh, I know in many of the meetings with CDSS and OCAP uh, that we're in, uh, we request that. So we're hoping we get more information because there's so many different levels of motivational interviewing, right? You have the certified person who's gone through those hundreds and hundreds of hours of obser observation, one down to line workers who can use some of the motivational interviewing tools, but have to report to a supervisor or someone who has been certified. So we need to assist you guys in, in deciding how that's going to look. And when we get more information, you'll definitely have it as well. Because, you know, you don't have to be a, a therapist to be therapeutic. So. Yeah. So I know I'm trying to think if it was I was looking at. Um, see CFPIC's spotlight. Um, and I know there was an, in, a mo an introduction to motivational interview webinar, and there's a recording link. And then there's also motivational interviewing. Now what uh, recording? So I don't know if that, I'll try and pull that link up. 
Um, I'm not sure if that recording, I haven't seen that one, um, if that kind of addresses some of the CQI things or if it addresses a training or, or what exactly, but I can go ahead and, and pull that link. I'll go ahead and share, there it is. In case anybody's interested in that, it's a recording of that webinar there. So that might be something worth um, checking out. Okay, anything else on motivational interviewing on this piece? I know there's a, a few um, trainers out there or, or contracts with other companies that are providing the training and, and so forth. I've also dropped in Caltrans training archive in the chat. I know they have some recordings of um, previous motivational interviewing um, trainings that they have done. And they also have an upcoming series on motivational interviewing um, as well as all sorts of other resources. Cool. Thanks, Bryn. Yeah. Caltrain, the training resources there are just, have just been, I think have been very helpful. And there's, there's definitely a lot going on in the training arena. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, should we move on? Definitely. Okay. So we're gonna get into a few other um, discussion questions, but we just kind of wanted to share this QR code and do um, what's called a Mentimeter, just kind of see where people are at. So you can probably use your phones, um, scan that QR code and just type in one word, two words, how you're feeling about your comprehensive prevention planning up till now, kind of see where, where you all are at. I also dropped process. a direct link in the chat. If like you, like me, I have issues with QR codes at times because my phone hates them. Um, so I dropped that direct link in the chat or you can go to menti.com and I'll type in the code now, which is three, seven, one, Eight two seven one eight. So there's three ways you can log on. Whatever is easiest for you. Cool. Thanks, Bryn. Try to see if I can. And I can um open that live link if you would like, Kathy. I can share. Click on the menti meter the um dot com. Yes. One second. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Cool. Thanks. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mentimeter always allows folks to be candid. Yes. Yes. And different. the Mentimeter is totally anonymous for anyone who is concerned about that. So feel free to share your real thoughts. <laughs> Please. Because this is definitely helpful because, it, you know, it, it's helpful for us. Absolutely. And just so you guys know how it works, the more times a particular word is put in there, if you don't know that comes up bigger and bolder. So hopeful that next we have confused. <laughs> and unclear. Yes. Overwhelmed. Yeah. Uninformed. So these are, are very um, encouraging to us because this is the reason we felt this sort of thing was needed and that we want to try to do something uh, at minimum quarterly, maybe with some contacts in between so that we can 
start to do this process together. Absolutely. It's, it's a lot. It's a, a big undertaking. And if anyone has trouble with the mentee um, and they don't mind not being anonymous, you can type it in the chat or you could send me a direct message and I'll keep it anonymous um, as to who the message is from. If you have anything you want to add and you can't access the mentee. folks a little bit more time and if you have more than one word you can also enter additional yeah feel free to <laughs> enter as much as you want yeah I know this is a group of, you know, of probation folks, but I would say that our human service agency folks would say they would use these exact same words to describe how they feel about the process. So I don't know that we're unique, but because um, <laughs> I've heard them use those exact words. So I know. <laughs> I would agree. I would agree, Seth. <laughs> a very good point. <laughs> Yeah, it's it really has been a big undertaking for you all, in addition to some of the other initiatives that are going on with probation that I'm aware of. It's um, it's a big undertaking in a short period of time, um, piled on top of other things that are happening for you all. Definitely. Yeah. I think this is a good springboard to our discussion questions, Kathy. I think so too, yeah. Okay, let me go back to... There we go. So thank you all for that. Um, so these are just, um, I mean, kind of looking at the meant meter words, um, confused, hopeful, unprepared, uncertain, unclear, overwhelmed. Um, there is a lot of but curious, um, slow progress, second fiddle to DFCS, uh, uninformed, contemplation, mixed feelings. So. Yeah, there's a lot of feelings around the CPP right now, uh, trying to figure things out and, you know, just gauging from our previous discussion and, and the other slides, just a, a lot of, you know, as, as Troy mentioned, is hurry up and waiting. And as we are under the timeline, you know, how can we kind of, given the information that we have, how can we kind of craft uh, such an important plan that's going to have a big impact on our community and our kids and families? Um, given the amount of information that we have. And so when Troy and I met, we, we kind of thought about, well, what are some of those other questions that come up for counties when you're thinking about your plans? And, and what is it that some of the questions to kind of help you make it a little bit more feasible, I guess, so to speak. Um, so we kind of threw these questions together and just to kind of some things to think about and in your own jurisdictions, um, what questions are there about EBPs? Uh, what do you all as a county have the capacity to do? Because capacity is a big issue, I know. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's all these other different initiatives happening within probation. And so how can you kind of look at what you're doing with one initiative or what are we doing with the prevention work and how can we kind of take what we're learning from all of the prevention work and kind of apply it to some of the other 
um, pieces that we're doing. Um, and then what do we have the funding? Do we have the funding that we need to, in order to make it happen? Um, what is your most sustainable EBP? Have you already done, um, implemented an evidence-based practice in your jurisdiction? And is there a way to maybe expand the populations versus kind of creating something new? And then how are you ensuring fidelity and then thinking about your implementation, ongoing quality assurance, booster trainings, et cetera. So I'll pause there and see if anybody has any thoughts or any, have you all thought about, are these kind of some of the questions that have come up in your jurisdictions already that you're kind of working on? Have you all had conversations around capacity within your jurisdictions? Around the prevention and what, what does that look like? Kathy, we we have, we actually um, submitted our plan and got it approved um, with uh, Child Welfare a few weeks ago. So we are gonna be doing FFT, um, as you know, <laughs> but we're gonna be, um, we're basically building on, we had a pretty robust FFT for our high-risk kids, you know, keeping in mind with all the, uh, you know, the uh, EVP stuff and all that. And so we're expanding it out into the prevention side of things for the pre-court, pre-adjudicated youth. And um, funding, we're, um, we're actually waiting to see if our provider has capacity to build it out um, right now, or if we have to look for a different provider, if they can. Um, our goal is to hopefully do that, and then they do their fidelity through um, oh their FFT national body that they that certifies them and certifies their train their teachers and, mm -hmm. and coaches and all of that kind of thing. Nice, thanks. I think congratulations, Robert. <laughs> I don't know if it's congratulations, honestly, <laughs> but <laughs> it's thank you. <laughs> Um, San Francisco just submitted its plan uh, a couple of weeks ago too. I think it just got approved yesterday or the day before. So um, I'll probably be able to say more about all these questions once we see how, how things unfold over the next you know 12 months. But um, um, and it, we're actually the probation department. We're using some of our other um, you know our block grant funding and other funding sources to um, get a um, multi-systemic therapy program over here in the county. So uh, again, once that, and we were kind of running into the same challenge that it sounds like you might be in Sacramento, finding the right provider, et cetera, et cetera. But um, um, so ask me in eight months and I might have some quick answers to these questions. <laughs> we're just getting started on it though. Our, very glad that that planning process is over and it's been approved. It feels good. Nice. Congratulations to you as well. Definitely. Yeah, for Orange County, um, we started looking at FFT after we moved away from motivational interviewing. And our providers, we just don't have anybody who is doing it and doing it to fidelity. And the two CBOs we do have that kind of have people um, those people are retiring. So like, we just don't have staff that can do it. So now we're gonna start looking at something else. Wow. Ivy, we've run into that with Humboldt County. We used to do FFT and TFCBT, but our children's behavioral health is um, tapped out <laughs> with staffing and um, the ability to, to offer any EVP, EVPs to any kind of fidelity at this point. And this is the type of information we want to take back to OCAP, right? So they have an understanding of staffing and capacity and various things like that that have been a challenge in our field since the beginning of time. So it's very understandable that it's 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 here again. Randy, you had your hand up. Um, yes. Yeah, so for Ventura County, you know, we um, are also going to be looking at our block grant funding and. Uh, we looked at two different things. Um, well, first of all, we looked at our data and we looked at our juvenile justice master plan to see what the gaps 
and services were previously identified. So, um, but for the MRT, so we basically, you know, we've used that for years within our department, but just expanding it and using a provider to, to offer it and then to ensure the fidelity and all of that. The second piece was looking at um, transportation because that's that was a, a gap that was identified. And so looking at targeted areas in our county and looking at our data uh, where, you know, many families are dual income and, um, you know, there, where there's less resources available. So we're looking at partnering with our school uh, districts to um, to basically work out uh, transportation from the school to an after school program or to one of our three evening reporting centers. Um, and so that way, you know, it's, just, it's all part of the pre preventative portion. We want to make sure that they are, you know, going from one place to another place where they're being productive and, you know, in a safe place, that type of thing. So um, so I think that's kind of where we're at right now. And um, I think, you know, we're, we'll go from there. But um, it, it was really interesting because I know that um, our um, human services agencies, you know, on their side, they were looking at MI. And so and I know they wanted us to kind of go in on that. But we were like, no, we've got some things that we're seeing on our end that, you know, we'd like to really, um, you know, explore. And after we saw the data, it really helped us to to figure out the the things on our end that we could really focus on. Thank you, Sandy. And uh, Jimmy had dropped into the chat. We have our fiscal folks on our steering committee. I wish I had more experience speaking their language and in our county. Maybe this is similar elsewhere. Probation has access to a tiny bit of funding compared to DFCF. So we have that as an issue. Yes. That's an issue across the board, without a doubt, um, in my mind. Um, I see a few head nods as well. Um, I think the biggest concept is you're not allowed to say in my presence that we're behind ever again, because writing the plan is just the beginning of this, right? And what I will tell you secretly, although this is being recorded, OCAP is 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 relaxing a little bit, meaning when your plan comes in, they're going to be willing to read it and give it back for some updates and things like that, because they're realizing that implementation is the real work as opposed to just getting that plan in. So we need to look at the plan as more of a fluid document. Ivy just gave us an example of where they had to pivot right from one EBT, EBP to another. So that's how we should kind of look like it. And we're never going to say we're behind. We're just going to say we're working hard. All right. Anybody else? Oh, and the other thing is, I think this is a good list of questions when you guys all receive this PowerPoint to have as discussion questions with your group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether it's your larger team or within your probation team to kind of really help you take inventory of where you all are at. Anybody else? Well, I, mean, I will just say, I think, um, Kathy, I think I've said this to you before, but we're definitely running into a lot of concerns, you know, with the CBOs who are going to be doing the motivational interviewing, et cetera, and implementing some of this stuff with the fact that we don't exactly know, you know, sort of what the funding is going to be, where it's going to come from. There's not going to be federal funding, you know, available for some of this stuff until six years from now. And so it's, they're like, they're all of a sudden going like, what's going on here? Like, we're going to enter into this partnership with you, meaning broadly the county and, um, or, you know, the, the, our, our human service agency, but we don't have, we don't know what it's going to look like in a year or two. So it's, we're really running into a lot of concern about that now. And it's, 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 it's a big issue. So with, with that uncertainty um, is, is really a, a, a challenge, both to the planning process, but now as we're moving into the implementation process, and now it's going to be a different kind of problem, but very similar. <clears throat> won't, won't affect probation so much because, you know, we, we're doing what we're doing with our share of the money. We have, we're funding a lot of these programs with, you know, um, as I said earlier with our, our new OBD and all those other allocations. So um, we're doing our thing, but as the, as our human service agency is really managing and implementing this broader, you know, you know, prevention effort, some of those CBOs are like beginning to freak out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we think about capacity. We think about provider capacity is what 
I seem to be hearing a lot more of about in terms of who's going to be able to provide the services that we've identified or that you all have identified in your plan versus in-house within your departments. I just wanted to say, I think in general, not specific to, to FFPSA, but as there's more and more things um, newly required and are implemented, it's it's tough on probation departments in general, capacity wise, to continue to be engaged in all of these initiatives and doing a really good job with it. For example, our department is, uh, our juvenile division is four people. We have three probation officers and a supervisor. So every single initiative falls on a very small group of people and it overlaps and becomes extremely overwhelming because we want to be good partners. We want to do the best for the kids in our community. We want to, to do everything that we can to do things with fidelity and with evidence-based practices. And so when we talk about capacity, it's also um, a combination of all of those things in terms of being in a small community that has very limited CBOs to begin with um having limited staffing and if you're even when you're fully staffed it's limited staffing and we all know every county in the state is having vacancy issues so i think it becomes a very overwhelming and daunting um scenario in general especially with the state um someone's comment on the slide about feeling like a second fiddle i think oftentimes probation's the afterthought and um, oftentimes not fully understood as to what we do. Um, and so we're constantly operationally waiting for what it's going to look like, like Seth was referring to. Um, so I think in general, not just specific to what we're talking about for today, I think it doesn't matter what we're, what we're sitting on, whether it's a SIP progress report or a CSA or whatever the situation may be, I think we're constantly being hit hard and wanting to be good players. Yeah. Seth brings up a really interesting point in the chat saying I didn't hear the word probation from anyone today until this breakout wow yeah Seth that's why I'm here it was, it was I have to say it was actually kind of shocking to me um that somebody went through in their presentation a whole bunch of partners and did not mention probation once I, I was shocked actually yeah. and it 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 it's the some ways the heart of the problem that I think a lot of us are facing. And Katie, I just want to say thank you for bringing up that point about the our own capacity, right? I mean, like there is, you know, four. Of, I feel like I, you know, if there was four of me, you know, could have like written a whole piece of that plan that would, you know, dive into all the stuff that probation is doing and blah blah blah. But we just can't. I mean, you know, we can't. I, there's only one of me, and you know, it's not. So that's a thank you for bringing that up and. And, but this point is sort of a companion point about the fact that from CDSS today, we did not hear the word where we have probation partners. And it's 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 evident in, in sort of everything they write and everything they produce that it's we, we are just not who they're thinking about. So we have that challenge too, little capacity, and then trying to fit a square peg into a round hole in some ways. Um, and I just want to say, while I have the floor for one second, we are running into the same problems here too about not being able to hire people. Going went to DPH to like do our our our, our motor, um, uh, one of our programs, and like they're like we can't do it. We have no capacity to do it at all. So we're really struggling with that too. So we're trying to manage a lot. So thanks for bringing that up, Katie. I think that's really important that our own capacity is like stretched to about as far as it can go for most of us anyway. Definitely. Yeah, I think the staffing shortages are pretty much statewide at this point in, in those challenges. And, and whether you're a large county or a smaller county, I think it's a little bit more challenging for some of the smaller counties. It's, to your point, Katie, is that you, know, you all are doing everything. And so when it's just, yeah, I can see how it can become overwhelming. Definitely. Well, we have about a minute. Our next oh. slide needs you to put a some sort of thumbs up emoji because we want to know yes. you want to do this again. Can we get together again? And maybe not make making you come to an individual meeting, but asking you to come 
to this to be a part of maybe a CPOC meeting that already occurs. Can you give me a thumbs up if you think this is something that's worthwhile and you would come back to? I see enough. I only need five. I got five or six already. So, um, okay. But as I mentioned in the opening, Perfect. this was a huge need. Um, I saw it about two years ago, and hopefully something is coming to fruition so that we can have deeper dialogues and support one another in this process. Yes. So, and, and Troy and I will definitely stay, remain in contact so we can kind of pull something together, whether it's, as he mentioned, using our existing meeting quarterly, we can kind of structure something out. So thank you all. I appreciate